Oh, great. Thank you so much. All right. So let's, uh, Margo, you want to dive into your question so we can make the most of the remaining time? Okay. So I would like to encourage many, many people to come to this talk. I'm so excited that you're coming, Stephen. I have, I think I read your book maybe two years ago, maybe more. And I've read a fair amount of historical biographies at this point, and it is one of my very, very favorites. Not Thank only you. because you just opened my eyes to everything that Rush had done, which I had no idea, which no one else will, um, but even the way you write it, like usually these these books take, you know, maybe a few chapters to get yourself in that 18th century mode and get you thinking that, I mean, your, your prologue was like, boom, and then it just took off. Even when I was preparing for this, I basically almost reread the book again. I just love it. And so I think people will absolutely love this book. It's a very big deal. So uh, hit on this a little, but when you, when I look at, you know, your resume and, and everything you've done, and then we were kind of talking at this, but then you jumped to Rush. What really spoke to you? What kind of experiences did you have leading up to this that made you commit to writing this huge book on Benjamin Rush? Well, two things. I mean, look, I am like most Philadelphians, um, way too unknowledgeable about what happened in my backyard. So, you know, we kind of love, hate tourists. We love, hate Independence National Park. We take our families there, you know, and we do the spiel, but it's like, you know, we don't embrace it. And so um, I actually had been looking for a way to embrace it. When I first started writing history books, you know, my wife said, well, we do live half a block away from, you know, six blocks away from every, you know, the beginning of America, there should be something there for you. Um, I originally was going to write a book about the Liberty Bell. Um, and I actually did a lot of research about the Liberty Bell and did a long book proposal about the Liberty Bell. And it turns out no one wants to buy a book that the main character is not a human. Um, and so while there are many interesting human stories about the Liberty Bell, there's kind of no through story. So um, but I got really interested in just the historical recreation of the different time periods that the Liberty Bell uh, are around. And interestingly, so I wrote a book about Benjamin Rush which was around all the recreation of the period of the revolutionary and post-revolutionary period. And the book I'm writing now um, is about World War I. Um, it, it, it's about a specific guy in the Wilson administration who uh, William Gibbs McAdoo. But um, part of it is about the Liberty Bell going across the country in 1915 to get America ready for war, which was sort of left over from that project. So I had it in my head that I wanted to do something about American history that was set in Philly uh, that would allow me to learn all this. And so I really just started looking at the stories. I mean, you you know, when you look at books, you look at what other books have been done and about what. I probably could have gotten a kind of read another John Adams book or another Benjamin Franklin book or another Thomas Jefferson book. But I thought, you know, Rush is so much more interesting than these guys. He hasn't been taken seriously as a pro as a biography subject literally for decades. I mean, there was one good biography written of him in the 1930s. Um, and, you know, he's the father of American health, mental health care. And which I knew in theory, because his picture was on the seal of the American Psychiatric Association. But even at, at the American Psychiatric Association, they didn't know why. Yeah. Like they didn't know what he had done. So um, I figured, you know, he's a guy who gets you to everybody. He was either friends or enemies with everybody in the American Revolution for many, many years. Um, and um, he cared about mental health and, and health care in a way that is interesting to me. Um, and his story extends through the whole revolution. So it's not just, you know, there are a lot of revolutionary figures who got killed in the war. There are people who died. You know, Rush was so much younger than the other founders that you get to see the revolution through the eyes of a young man and watch him, you know, become more interesting, more powerful and age. And he, you know, he lives until 1813. So that's not just the revolution. It's, it's the entire story of America and then keeping America together um, after, you know, uh, the Constitution and, and and all that kind of stuff. So and it, the more I found out about Rush, the more I realized he was he was so I mean, we didn't even have the word woke when I started this book. But, you know, he was the most woke of the founding fathers. I mean, he wrote a pamphlet against slavery in 1773 you know at, at, which not only was against slavery but talked about the psychological impact of slavery on black people 
you know, which is something that it took, you know, like incredible long time to pay attention to issues like this. So it just everywhere he went, he was really interesting. I mean, there are times when he's over the top, but I kind of like that. Um, He's never uncolorful. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's a good writer to the public. I mean, so his the idea of his work was it's almost all translational. So it's almost all him trying to explain ideas to the general public rather than like lawyer to lawyer writing or businessman to businessman writing or doctor to doctor writing. So it's not surprising that he convinced Thomas Paine to write common sense. You know, he would have written it himself because, but he was afraid because after his pamphlet on slavery came out, he lost like almost all of his business because people found out that he wrote it. So he figured, you know, let's let Thomas Paine do this. You know, if, if his life is destroyed by it, he's just a freelance writer. He can, he can you know, disappear. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose my, I'm not going to lose my business again. But the idea that, you know, we have this very esoteric idea of independence, what is it, you know, and why should you not be afraid of it? And why should you embrace it? Um, It was very deliberate and it very much fits in the mission of what Rush always was trying to do, which is explain big ideas to the public um, to make sure that the country that they were trying to create embraced them. Um, and that, you know, to not be, uh, he wasn't elitist in any way. I mean, he was always trying to explain stuff to the public, even when he was completely wrong, because of course, in medicine, many of the things that they were sure of at that time, you know, turned out to be completely made up. So he was just, he was the gift that kept on giving because honestly, I could see very quickly that he would be a great project for me. And I pitched the book in a very active way to an editor who was really into it. But at the beginning of books, you have no idea what you don't know you know you, you know you're doing what every every college student does you know you look on wikipedia pages and you look at you know whatever's available and you buzz through some existing books well, but... Margo, do you have a question about how he did the research or i was gonna jump to well i'm gonna jump out sure, of my go ahead because... stop me always stop no, 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 me. it's fine so i do think there's such a wealth of uh information that and not just sitting around, you really had to to search for some of this, but it must have been fun to see, wow, there's a lot, this guy kind of touches everything. So I was going to ask you, did you make any discover any new discoveries? Because I know you even mentioned, um, so it's Lyman Butterfield and Dr. Carlson's work, and then you even opened the boxes of their unfinished research and then yeah. carried it forward to write this book, right? And there's more to do, I know. But And then there were those letters that Butterfield never got to, um, that that descendant of Rush, the skeletal woman, whatever, gave away. Yeah, yeah, Julia <laughs> um, Rush. Uh, yes, yes, Henry. Um, what what did you find and, and carry forward with your book? What new discoveries or new letters or new information did you feel that you added to this biography that others hadn't before you? Well, I mean, the first thing is, is that, you know, it's very easy for any story to get locked in time. Like once there's once there's a little bit of writing about it, people just copy that. Um, and that's what had happened to Rush. No one had done any new research on Rush since Butterfield and Carlson died. So I mean, it might have might have been a very interesting time, but up until the the end of the 80s and the 90s, you know, these two guys, one a psychiatrist, one a historian, each of them wanted to push the Rush story forward. And both of them died before they could finish their work. So Butterfield had edited the Rush letters in 1951, but then he got hired to edit the Adams letters and that took over his whole life. Then when he retired from the Adams letters, he was going to write a biography of Rush. And he spent quite a bit of time doing it. And then he dropped dead. Um, and at least he was sick and they knew it was coming with Carlson. Carlson ran the um, at, at, at um, uh, Cornell Weill ran the top psychiatric history uh, department in the country. And he was obsessed with Rush um, and was writing a book. And he just he literally he dropped dead. And they just boxed up his stuff and it was still in the closet they had put it in um, okay. when when he died. And so so it's not like people didn't know that these two guys were interesting. It's just like it, you can't replace somebody who's that into it unless they have a ton of students who have a lot of time and energy. So this stuff just stopped. So the first thing, but it took me a long time to figure this out. I mean, that these things were there and they could be available. So Carlson's work was less useful to me 
except he wrote a book, an unpublished book um, that we were able to work, work with. It, a lot of it was about medical ideas and somebody honestly should edit that book for doctors because it was really like a intellectual history of medicine using Rush's ideas and lectures. But, you know, uh, what, what, you know, what Butterfield had done, I mean, Butterfield was saving string on a Rush biography for like 30 years. It's like, he loved Rush. He, he started being a big deal historian because he loved Rush. And at the beginning of his career, he would like produce these little pamphlets just for his friends because he found these things that Rush wrote so delightful and weird and interesting. And then he got like a, 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 a big job, you know, editing Adams and Adams wasn't that big a deal then either. So that stuff was really interesting to me. Um, there were a lot of things that, um, about the medicine part that people had it, a lot of it just connecting the dots because Pennsylvania hospital actually had a lot of stuff, but they didn't know it and they didn't care. And they were also afraid that it was a HIPAA violation to let me see it, even though it was 300 years old. <laughs> um, so for a long time, we were just arguing with them about why we couldn't see these medical records, yeah. including, including by Russia's kids, medical records. Um, and they were like, no, there's a HIPAA law that says that we can't release mental health records, you know, no matter what, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and we actually worked with the Scattergood Foundation. We almost sued them um, just because that we didn't think it was right. And also it was a bad precedent. I mean, if you're going to write about medical history, old medical records should be available. So it turned out that the Philosophical Society had a complete set of these records oh my God. that someone had made copies of back when it wasn't illegal and they had pdfs of it so wow. so we just we we made a we made our own copy of it and brought it home and i'm sure the pennsylvania hospital wondered like, like why aren't they bugging me anymore about this but so because of this you know you can see every person when they went into pennsylvania hospital mental health or not why they came in what their diagnosis was you know what floor they were on how long they were there whether they paid or what you know so that was just a thing that like no one had connected that before and and there were other writings of rushes that no one had paid much attention to because they weren't digitized mm -hmm. so the things that are digitized they're so easy to get to you you know you don't work that hard for the stuff that isn't but like one of the things that we were really interested in was how early was rush doing what we consider to be psychiatry mm -hmm. you know because it's normally said that he did that in the 1890s or in the in the 1790s and 1800s which means the french did it first um mm -hmm. But we were like, that doesn't make sense to us. So we actually went back and we found student records of notes, you know, of lectures he was giving where he was putting out these ideas. Mental illness is a disease. Alcoholism is a disease. There's a genetic component. You know, we have to treat them medically and not as religious failures or failures of will. I mean, these ideas, we're still trying to operationalize them today. I mean, too many people still don't believe them. But the idea that this is important, it just came to rush earlier. We were really excited that we could show through uh, medical records. Um, and so some of them have Rush's name. The, the biggest problem is, is that you'd think that everything you're looking for would have Rush's name on it. Yeah. Um, but it kind of doesn't. You have to look for things that are that that he touched that you can figure out he wrote. So it was it was endlessly interesting. And honestly, it didn't stop when the book was over because some of the subjects that we did some work on in the book. Like I didn't want any one subject to take over the book. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem with Rush. You can just be focused on black white issues. You can just be focused on mental illness issues. You can just be focused on uh, separation of church and state issues, you know? And usually when people write about him, they're mostly interested in one thing. And so that's, that's what you get in these books. My idea was give people enough of everything so they understood all the subjects Rush gets you to make it interesting, put all the footnotes at the end so that if somebody wants to follow it, they can, but never put a footnote number in the book because I hate footnote numbers in the book. I love how you did that. You said that at the end of the prologue, you're like, all right, it's all going to be in the back and I'm going to try to leave the language the way it was. And I was like, that's really nice. <laughs> and the other thing that's good about Rush is that he had good handwriting. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah, because not every historical figure, you can really read what they wrote. Yeah. That's but Rush true. was the only doctor in America, maybe, with good handwriting. Um, <laughs> so true. you could read the things that weren't digitized. But it was, you know, it, it just, it required, 
what what I think history books are supposed to be is that they're supposed to be biographies, but they're only supposed to be biographies to a point. Like the, the history books that I like that are biographies are partially biographies and they are partially a walk through the time period. And the reader doesn't care if Benjamin Rush knew about a certain thing or was impacted by it. They want to know that it happened and it mattered in the world. Mm -hmm. So not so not everybody agrees with this, but I mean, to me, when I write a book like this, I want to bring together as much as possible so that people go, oh, that was happening then too. Um, I love that. I loved it. That's. I think that's why your book is so um, fascinating and it feels so huge and so interesting. It reminds me of um, kind of like David McCullough's book on John Adams, where you're like, boom, John well, Adams. That's the, like that's the model. Book. You know, John, yeah, you know, right. and he, you know what? That book came out much later than people realize. I know it did. I know. You know, it's it's really yeah. one of his later books, and it yeah. really it came out the same year as Devil in the White City. Mm. And but that, it really is so an cool. example of that. Um, and yeah, no, my whole look the whole time I was doing Rush, I was so afraid that David McCulloch would write a book on Benjamin Rush. Oh my gosh! <laughs> he loved he loved Benjamin Rush. Yeah. He often he spoke at Dickinson about Benjamin Rush. It seemed like. Honestly, he would have been better off writing about Benjamin Rush than the last book he wrote that I think was not so successful, the one about the Indians. But um, we were always afraid that he would write a book about Benjamin Rush because he was obviously so interested in him. And Rush was one of the best characters in the in the John Adams biography. Yes, yes. So actually, so, let's tell people. OK, let's break down. I mean, and Rush. the other answer to your question is for Philly institutions. We found yeah. stuff at, at the Rosenbach that nobody knew was there. Yeah. Including, okay. including the Rosenbach. Okay. Um, and we found stuff at the College of Physicians that people didn't know was there. And um, we found some things at Morvin over in Princeton that people yeah. didn't know was there that had to do with like, uh, this is a small thing in the book, but the fact that Richard Stockton slaves were freed when he died. Mm -hmm. And then one of them... Um, Marcus Marsh came and worked for Rush and was in Rush's house working with him during Yellow Fever. Uh, so, so Morvin's the Stockton yeah. estate, right? I'm sorry? Morvin is the Stockton estate, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so, okay, so you found that. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So it's, some, it's sometimes it's just little things that then when you put them in, then when people read them, they go, oh, of course you should want to know that. But, yeah. but it comes from like a, a lot of it, it just comes from weird, different places. And you're the first one to, to like connect. I mean, history writing is connecting dots. Yeah. So the question is like, where do you find new dots? Yeah. You know, where, and then, and then how do you connect the first one them? to transcribe um, the letter that Rush wrote to his wife about Washington? I'm not the first one to transcribe it. I'm the first one to even know it existed. Yeah. And the Rose well, the, had it for 30 years. That one of the things they had. Okay. Wow. Oh my God. When I called the guy from the Washington papers and told him about that letter, he was, he was, it, 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 wow. I mean, obviously he can't say what the fuck, but he was basically saying that. I mean, because, because it's, it's ridiculous yeah. that a letter yeah. like that would be sitting in, you know, oh. Rosenbach is a bit, is a pretty big place. That's a huge, but this is what happens when families donate things and they yep. don't, they don't give money for them to be processed. Oh my gosh. That's a sin. So, oh, you know, and that stuff is still there. We're still trying to get them to, um, to do more with it. They, you know, they just don't have money. So Margo, where else, what else do you want to ask about? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, well, I want to break down Rush. Yeah, maybe me. we should make the Q and A longer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, maybe we need an hour and a half for him to be up there. Um, okay. So I want to break down Rush for people because there's so many categories of things he touches. So I want to give people a sense of just kind of how huge he was. So okay. uh, what is name category? Give us like a few highlights of achievements or things he did in this category. Okay. So medicine, we know Dr. Benjamin Rush, medicine, what would you say? Um, first thing that he did really was to uh, help revolutionize medicine during the Revolutionary War. So his, his critiques of not only how the hospitals ran, but of the general way that soldiers took care of themselves. Um, and you know, the piece that he wrote before he joined the, the, the army hospitals, which was mostly about like where, where people go to the bathroom and, and how to keep clean and how to change your socks, you know, because he also didn't, he figured if you went to the hospital, you were dead, you know, hospitals were a place where people, you know, so his goal was, preventive medicine and so the things that he wrote both during the war to try to keep uh 
people safe. He also was the one who convinced Washington to give smallpox vaccinations to the troops, which some have suggested is the single biggest thing that kept people alive in the Revolutionary War. And then later he wrote about the psychological aspects of war. I mean, he in his book on mental illness, he definitely wrote about people that had what we would call PTSD now from the war. Um, so those were the things that he was interested in. Um, I mean, he also had ideas about how to run the hospitals and all, and, and typical Philadelphia doctors, all they did was argue about it. Um, because, you know, keep in mind, he was working in the hospitals with his with his two mentors who hated each other's guts. Hated each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Morgan and Shippen were, were the heads of the hospitals before him. These guys were all from Philly. They all hated each other. And it was really not pretty. So, but but that's that's the medical things. I mean, but you're not including mental health, right? Well, I would put that. The, well, there. the other thing, the other thing I would say is keep in mind that Rush ran um, for many years the first medical school in America. Yep. So, what people forget is while many of the treatments that they taught then we now think are ridiculous, um, bloodletting, blah blah blah. His lectures on how to be a doctor. And every year he gave an introductory lecture to the beginning of the medical school year actually sound exactly like the challenges of being a doctor today. They're about how you deal with patients. They're about how you deal with new information. They're about how you deal with the medical past. But so while many of his treatments are, out, are as outdated as everything else from that time period, the ideas that went into what an American medical school would be are really incredibly important still. Um, and he was very much the first star of American medical education. So even though his mentor started the school at Pennsylvania Hospital, they weren't as famous as him. You know, he was like the first, you know, when, when America became America, especially after the Constitution was written, he was like the doctor of America. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that lasted for 20 some years. You know, so it was a very big deal as, and people forget, at this time, people still thought you had to go to Europe to be smart. Yeah. You know, if you really wanted to be smart, you had to go to university in Europe. American universities were not considered, you know, the same thing. So the fact that they created a medical school that mattered in America and led to all the other medical schools in America, I think people forget that part and they just go like, oh, he did bloodletting. He must have been an idiot. Yeah. Um, no, so. he and his mentors even had to go to Edinburgh to get educated. I mean, they didn't they didn't stay within America to become to get that medical education. That's a huge deal. Um, anyway, okay. so that's that's my not very short list. So go ahead. What oh, was the next? Good. One? How about Revolutionary War? Well, you know, Rush was in the first in the Second Continental Congress. He wrote the Declaration of Independence for Pennsylvania. So while Jefferson was writing the standard Declaration of Independence for everybody, Rush's was Rush was writing the, the Pennsylvania one. Um, he wasn't in the Congress long enough to make a huge impact on that. I mean, he certainly signed the Declaration of Independence, which which, you know, you get a lot of props for. But, you know, he had just joined the Continental Congress like three weeks before. You know, he interestingly, he signed because John Dickinson wouldn't sign. <laughs> um, so it's all about kind of Pennsylvania politics. So I think that he made some impact on that language. He certainly, as the head of the medical committee for the Continental Congress, made them aware of the importance of medicine. Um, and uh, his, in a funny way, I feel like his writing after, like the thing that he wrote in the in the 1780s, um, that thing, you know, the, the American, the Revolutionary War is over, but the American Revolution has just started. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people always quote that it's on the wall at the, American, at the museum. You know, he wrote that later. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't write it in the middle of the war. He wrote it when he was afraid that people were forgetting what the war was about. Yeah. And and also he was afraid that Washington and Jefferson and Adams and all those guys, when, when it came to writing the Constitution, they were going to say, like, you know what? I did my thing. You know let the next people do it and the, he wrote that thing to to embarrass them into all coming to the to the constitutional convention and to be part of the fight over the constitution which also led them to serve and be presidents and stuff like that you know but again they were older than him so he was like trying to he was trying to keep franklin involved because franklin was sick and they weren't going to let him come to the cotton to the constitutional convention and rush is the one who insisted you know, he's like, this is Benjamin Franklin. Are you kidding me? If you have to carry him there, he's coming and going to represent Pennsylvania. And 
I, I do think that he can be credited with getting Washington Jefferson Adams to stay interested and stay involved. It now seems like so obvious that they should, but you know, again, these were people who involved in a pretty big war and in a post-war period that was really more screwed up than we realize. Like people ignore 1781 through when they signed the declaration when to so when they signed the constitution. It was a time of great unclarity about what America was supposed to be, except we won the war and we weren't under England anymore. Yeah. You know, so um, I think that he was really, um, he had some hand in the re original revolution. The other hand that he had is that he wrote the proclamation that led to the Boston Tea Party. Yes. Um, so right. the, the group that wrote the Philadelphia Tea thing, which the people in Boston used because they figured this is a good thing. We don't need to write another one. But that's what ran in the papers in Boston. That's what led Samuel Adams, you know, to do the Tea Party. And they just didn't do one in Philly because by then the tea company was afraid to come up <laughs> to come up to Philadelphia and they just sort of didn't do it. So he was involved in that. But so Margo, you know, do you have one more question before we run out of time? Or yeah, go or ahead. Sorry. Yeah, well, there's a million. Okay. So you know how uh, Benjamin Rush, basically, he knew all the important people during that time. You realize that he was connected with, I mean, all the big names. And then we won't go into the story of how he reconnected his best friends, Jefferson and Adams, though that is just a beautiful story. Um, but do you, th what do you think, uh, what personality traits or character traits do you think he had besides many times being that person's doctor as well? And their confidant, he really became this person who people would just pour their hearts out to. They give them not only their most secret physical ailments, but also just their views on religion or their thoughts. And he just knew so many people and they really confided in him. What would you say, uh, he had I think that. part of it is that he's a doctor in a world of, you know, the, the people that he was around in the revolution were military people, lawyers, and business people, primarily. There were actually very few physicians involved in this effort because there weren't that many physicians in America at that time. And being a physician was not such a big deal at that time. So Rush was considered as smart as all these people, as engaged as all these people, he was unbelievably opinionated and a terrible gossip, or or actually a good gossip if you're in favor of gossip. Um, and, you know, keep in mind that these people had to, he was also like a bit of a tour guide. So pe one dynamic people forget about the American Revolution is how many times people from out of town had to come to Philly. <laughs> and and like, you know, not only know like where, where they could get medical care, but like where they could eat and who a good tailor was and stuff. So the rushes... You know, Rush when he was single, then the Rushes when they were married were very much like the hosts or among the hosts of the city, uh, which, which they inherited. You know, the doctors, the First Continental Congress, which Rush wasn't at, the doctors took care of everybody. You know, you always see like, where are the Washingtons tonight? Well, they're having dinner at the Shippen's house because, you know, Shippen Sr. was like one of the top doctors. So the doctors were there to sort of do that and Rush inherited that as as the younger version of that and so um you can really see and he also he really cared about relationships and he wrote a lot about them and he paid a lot of attention to them i mean he elevated them you know you could argue that the that the the person who was most obsessed about the relationships between the founders was rush it was almost like he was writing a novel about them as the whole thing unfolded and, you know, he did. I mean, when he went in, in 1800, he wrote one version of his ongoing description of every person who signed the Declaration of Independence, which was which he'd been working on for a long time. And he only ever showed it to John Adams. But, you know, keep in mind that the chroniclers of this time were the ones who were going to decide what the story was. Mm -hmm. So if you were a good writer and you were in, involved in it, you were like me. You're like a journalist who's, you know. Who can walk the walk, but ultimately is going to go away and write a story. Um, and if you ever read, which people don't, like in in the middle of Rush's autobiography, which he wrote for his kids, he describes every person who write who was in the Continental Congress. Some of them very unkindly, <laughs> um, and just be, but he just thought it was really fun. It's part of the reason why his family wouldn't let it be published after he died, because he could be really mean. I, I don't think he was wrong. But he was he did not was not decorous. You know, he you know, for somebody who was religious, he he did not mind getting in an argument. Here's how he was religious. He's somebody who's very religious who wants to go up at the end of, of, of a church service and have an argument with the preacher about the sermon. 
<laughs> right. So th that actually is Rush, you know, in his essence. I mean, he really believed in the importance of those discussions um, and that you could totally dis I mean, that's why I think we have so much to learn from him. That you could totally disagree about something, but you had to be able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so every person who knew him, all these famous people at one point wished they hadn't told him something. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and of course, when he when he died, the first thing that Adams and Jefferson was like, get those letters back that I wrote to him. <laughs> oh you know? my gosh. I know. I think that was the first thing in Jefferson's mind. So. Yeah, but but that's that's why he's such an interesting character. And I think that why they all found him interesting. Um and if Hamilton had lived, it would have it might have been the same thing. But he and Hamilton really didn't like each other. Um but the other thing is is that they they were getting older and their kids were friends. And part of the thing that I've always been interested in, and no one ever writes about this. But at a certain point, you guys are probably parents. Um, yeah. And you know that at a certain point, your kids' friends matter in your life as much or more than your own friends. Yeah. So the thing that I always found interesting about this is at a certain point, and part of it is when they're all in Philly, their kids are getting old enough to matter. And their kids' psychological problems and drinking problems and other things, and their kids' aspirations. And it's interesting, Russian Adams are the only founding fathers whose children mattered in the government of America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Adams' son, you know, not only John Quincy Adams was president, but Adams' other son died of alcoholism. Um, and, you know, Rush was there to sort of help the family through that. So it, these relationships are very close. And I just think that Rush was a guy who had close relationships with people, even if they seemed difficult. Um and and it comes through in his writing and that's why like so you read that john adams biography yeah so that john adams biography used a ton of rush's writing that most people had never paid attention to because mm -hmm. mcculloch understood that rush had the best descriptions of adams yes yes you know just because he was his friend they were in letters they were in different stuff so it's like uh, uh, to me mcculloch is the first one who figured out the modern way to deal with rush mm. that, that he was just like this a brilliant gossipy guy who was interested in everything and until his dying day was trying to make sure that like America figured itself out. And, yeah. and I still think that the issues that he brings up in medicine, in politics, in religion, in just friendship, they are still the issues. And his prism is still to me, incredibly modern. You know, mm -hmm. and I was doing this book before and during the Trump, you know, the first Trump election. And the other part of it is that, you know, people have this tendency of being like, OK, we broke America. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting is that when you read Rush, what you see is that these guys were afraid they broke America like five minutes after they made it. For sure. And yeah. they were definitely worried that they broke it after 1800. And then, you know, when you're getting more into the War of 1812. They were basically you know, like, we we totally blew this. And so the idea that every generation is afraid that they broke America and they have to re-ask what America is supposed to be is, is really important to America. Um, and, and I think Rush was really good at exemplifying that. Um, and if I can, you know, again, I, I view this that way too. Um, and if, I, and if, if my biography of Rush can make people ask those questions, um, rather than thinking that there are answers, like, I guess that's the other thing, you know, Rush is, just like a, a doctor, doctors are very much aware of what's not known yeah. and what can't be known, but, but you have to do something about. It. And also that there are different points of view. I think that America periodically loses its understanding that that's, that that's the normal state of people. And, you know, I think Russia is kind of always there to remind you of that. Um, in the pre-revolutionary time, you know, the Tea Party time, the first fighting times, the middle of the Revolutionary War time, the... Uh, time when things are really bad, when Washington's at Valley Forge and everything sucks, you know, and that's when Rush and Washington have their fight because Rush comes and sees what's going on. And no one else wants to say this because they don't want to admit how bad it is. And Rush is like, no, this is bad. You know, we could we could definitely lose. Um, and, and and then his family wouldn't tell anybody about all this stuff because they were afraid that if you said that out loud, that would be bad. So, you know, what you inherit at Valley Forge is that challenge, which is there's a version of Valley Forge where you're not supposed to say anything bad about anybody because everything in American history is perfect. <laughs> Even though if you read it, nothing is perfect. It's all a big, 
argument and a miracle that they that it all happened. Well, that is something that we try to do um, with Valley Forge Park clients is to really illustrate what a challenge it was that they almost lost and how difficult this, the circumstances were during the encampment, how rough it was. Because if you just think that Valley Forge represents triumph, then you're missing the story of Valley Forge and an important part of the American story. And so that is something that we are going to really key in on when you're speaking to our members um, in a few weeks. And uh, and I just want to thank you for giving us so much time today. Um, hey, and... I like talking about this. It's easier than talking about mental health. <laughs> <laughs> well, the two are intertwined. Um, and so we yeah. will um, figure out or we'll figure uh, the uh, rest of the uh, details for the event. We'll do that over email. And um, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's cool. been a real hey, Thanks honor. for having me. It's really, um, it's, I've been really looking forward to doing this. And uh, and look, I'm also just interested in being associated with any historical institution in the greater Delaware Valley that has a cool take on this and cares about writers. Well, we definitely do that. So thank you so much. It's been great sure. speaking. Great talking to you. Margaret, great to see you again. And uh, I'll see you. I'll see you soon. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. See ya. Bye-bye.